Sure, sir, I'll begin then. So hello and welcome everyone to the Be Wastewise webinar of the month. I'm Akanksha Singh. I'm the community builder at Be Wastewise. And uh, those of you who are joining our platform for the first time, uh, let me introduce you uh, to our organization. Be Wastewise is a non-profit organization to grow around the principles of uh, dialogue and diversity, addressing the need for knowledge dissemination on waste management since 2013. It's been a decade of bridging the waste solution expertise gap worldwide. We started off with one moderator in 2013, and now we have more than 12 moderators who are among the best at what they uh, do, and they come from different geographies and uh, from different parts of the world and societies. Together, they're posing questions, teasing out insights and guiding conversations, just like how Professor Dubey currently is going to do, uh, and uh, which are going to guide such conversations that are more relevant to us than any other uh, online or offline platforms. Uh, we have more than uh, 300 contributors as well who take part in this journey with us. If you see the value in making such diverse sustainability dialogues, uh, such as these, available free of charge to anyone and everyone across the globe, then support us in our mission. Um, you know, every donation is an investment towards our collective future. And we encourage you all to do check out our website and donate. Uh, we will be sharing the link for the donation page over the chat as well. Now, moving on to the discussion today, we have our very eminent and uh, learned moderator, uh, Dr. Brijesh Kumar Dubey. Uh, Professor Dubey has been moderating our webinars for many years together now. He's an environmental engineer, educator, and uh, uh, he's a trainer, researcher, and as consultant in the area of circular engineering, environmental engineering sciences, and health, and presently working as a professor at IIT Kharagpur. Uh, Dr. Dube has worked with several government agencies in many countries on various environmental projects and has authored or co-authored more than 250 publications in his area of expertise. Uh, today, Professor Dube, along with the esteemed panel that we have, uh, will be discussing on the re recent plastic treaty that many nations around the world have agreed to sign up for. Let's hear from those who are part of the treaty on what's happening, what to expect next, who's involved, and what this treaty means to informal recyclers, other waste processors, citizens, and different countries worldwide. To address uh, these issues, we have today a very interesting panel. Uh, Mr. Kaushik Chandrasekhar, he's joining from United Nations Environment Program. He's an assistant program uh, management officer there. And he's a waste management professional with over 13 years of experience in the waste management and resource efficiency domains. We welcome you, sir. Our next panelist uh, joining with us today is Ms. Deepti Shrikant from New Zealand. She is an associate gender and climate change with Neo Climate Solutions. She is a researcher and communicator and has experience in applying gender and intersectionality perspectives to climate action and promoting GSI inclusion. Hello, uh, Dipti. Uh, we request uh, also to uh, make note that uh, Dr. Virendra Kumar Do uh, Gupta, unfortunately, head of uh, R&D Polymer and uh, senior vice president from Reliance Industry, won't be able to join. But instead, we have Dr. Harshit Patil uh, from Reliance Industries, who is a group lead for the Polyfin Process Development Group, joining in today for this discussion. With 20 years of research experience, his work involves process development and scale-up of polyolefin catalysis and its systems at Reliance. He's author, co-author of 20 research papers, inventor, co-inventor of 16 patents and patents application, including five U.S. granted patents. We welcome you, sir. Before we proceed to this exciting discussion, we would request you all to know that this, this particular webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on our website and YouTube channel. Please use the Q&A function for your questions to the panel. We request you all to please use this platform to raise as many queries as possible related to the topic for our panel in this lineup as you see that this lineup of speakers for this topic you surely won't be able to get on any other platform so soon. So we request you all to please use uh, the chat function for your comments and the Q&A function for all your queries. And also please note that uh, in case any queries are not being answered, then we make sure that these questions are being given back to the panel and they get answered post the webinar. 
So back to the topic, Professor Dubey, what is the status on the treaty and how, how will it impact the global plastic pollution? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Akancha. And again, I welcome all the our panelists, co-panelists here, as well as all the participants from around the world. It's really nice to see people from various parts of the globe uh, uh, coming together today to discuss this issue. So as Akancha also mentioned, uh, we try to keep the dialogue uh, like a both ways. So we would we strongly encourage you to put your questions in Q&A and also put your thoughts in the chat, which we'll be trying to uh, bring in. So I'll not take much uh, time. Uh, we will. Be, we have a very esteemed panelist here with us. As we all know, you since those of us who have uh, have joined here, we are well aware that plastic pollution is a problem, and but plastic as a material also it's quite useful. So we have we have to kind of using plastic, and for some we are trying to get the alternatives, but it's still it's a long way when the plastic will be totally gone. But we have to manage this uh, plastic pollution. Otherwise, what we see is it is getting into the river, getting into the ocean. So plastic is in water. Even sometimes we hear that it is in our drinking water bottles. It's there in air now. And uh, it's there in your uh, even placenta. Uh, so breast milk. So plastic does ending up at various uh, places where it should not end up. So that's the whole basic kind of, if you look at a very big, very big picture, very simple, why this treaty is even thought about is just to manage this uh, plastic pollution in a more effective way with a global effort, because this is a global problem. It's not a site specific or a country specific problem. So without further delay, we'll be having a discussion on that. So I'll, I'll invite uh, the first panelist, uh, Kausik Chandrasekhar, who comes from UNEP and uh, which is kind of, they are the driving force behind this treaty. So Kausik ji, for, uh, we'd like to learn from you that uh, what is the salient points of the treaty, where it stands today, by when we will be able to see it, uh, see final draft. Right now we have the zero draft. So floor is yours for next 10 minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you, Rajesh. Just, just hoping I'm audible. Yes. So thank you, uh, Rajesh. Firstly, I'd like to thank P. Waste Wise, uh, Akansha, uh, for having me on this webinar uh, on the UN Plastics Treaty. Um, I'd like to begin by saying that uh, plastics and its end of life management has largely been there in this center space globally for some time now. Like Rajesh was mentioning that you know, it is uh, an end of life problem, uh, while you know, it's also useful in many ways. However, you know, you see that uh, there's been a renewed energy around this, especially after this historic resolution of 514 that, uh, you know, in UNIA 5.2 uh, that happened in Nairobi in March uh, 2022. Uh, to, to tell you uh, the resolution, uh, you know, in simple terms, uh, this was largely put together to negotiate an international treaty. Um, and, you know, it's a binding treaty on plastic pollution. Uh, this would include the marine environment as well, uh, and uh, you know we're looking to you know coming uh, you know uh, come to an end of it by 2024. Uh, so it's interesting to see what this actually means. Uh, you know, uh, compared to the efforts like the Minamata Convention on Mercury, uh, UNIA 5.2 adopted this resolution to negotiate a legally binding treaty to address the complete life cycle. It's a complete uh, life cycle of plastic right from cradle to grave. And uh, for uh, listeners uh, uh, you know, new, new to UNIA, uh, the United Nations Environment Assembly uh, is a global decision-making body on environment. Uh, it has the membership of about 193 member states and meets once in two years. Uh, now, it's important for us to understand that this is not a one-off effort and there has been a steady buildup of consensus towards this. Uh, you will see that in September 2021, uh, countries like Germany, uh, Ghana, uh, Vietnam, they jointly organized a global conference on marine litter and plastic pollution. This was done in Geneva, which resulted in a ministerial statement calling for a new global agreement on plastic pollution at UNIA 5.2. Now, this was followed in uh, February 2022, uh, where 11 new governments which included Canada, Greece, Italy, and some like-minded governments, uh, you know, get together as a part of the new plastic economy global commitment at the One Ocean Conference, One Ocean Summit that happened. Now, it is after this that we see that in March 22, world leaders agreeing to this historic resolution of 514 at Nairobi. 
so you can see that you know there has been a build up towards you know uh, the the resolution uh, and the agreement that we saw so then uh, the inter uh, the intergovernment negotiating committee the inc uh, began working in the second half of 2022 so till date we've seen three meetings which are complete um, and i'd like to update you on each of these meetings that the first meeting was held in november 2022 in uruguay largely it was decided that the ambition to come up with a binding treaty should end by 2024 uh, you know there is a time limit to it and we should work towards that uh, so that you know we are able to see uh, uh, you know light at the end of the tunnel uh, it was also decided that you know the process should include active engagement with the stakeholders across the plastic value chain so whatever steps are being suggested whatever uh, you know actions are being suggested as a part of the treaty must be in engagement with the uh, stakeholders who are there across the plastic value chain in inc2 that's happened in uh, may 2023 in paris it was decided that a zero draft would be placed uh, you know well ahead of inc3 and uh, all the observers and the member countries were encouraged to give their inputs so that it goes into this uh, zero draft and that could be deliberated and rightly so in inc3 uh, which which you know got completed very recently in november 2023 it saw the zero draft being circulated uh, you know prior to the meeting and detailed deliberations on each and every point of the working draft was you know seen uh, so as we all know the zero draft is the mother document that uh, holds the possible options and also the inclusions uh, that we are looking to negotiate as a part of the treaty although the text and uh, the agreements have not been uh, you know finalized yet or frozen the draft document you can see is largely divided into six parts uh, and and just to give you an insight of each of these you know part 1 talks of the objective the preamble what is the scope of this treaty and what is what it is trying to address as a part of the part 2 we are looking at the technical details this is the heart of the treaty we are talking of you know what are the technical inclusions as a part of this treaty part 3 talks about financing it's a very very critical part where where the money will come from where can the member states explore possible funding for this uh part 4 we talk of uh implementation how are each of these member countries going to go about implementing these efforts what is going to be the reporting structure how would these member states reach out to the secretariat in terms of reporting their you know updates on a on a cyclic basis and how would monitoring verification takes place and you know these are an ambit of things that you know are covered under this part 4 part 5 talks of the institutional framework that's very very key again on who are the key stakeholders as far you know as part of these countries who would be taking action on it who would be the relevant stakeholders from the secretariat who would be involved in the process and uh, so on and so forth so in part 6 we are looking at all the annexures you know the placeholders you know uh, uh, the technical details which you know would be referred to as part of the topic now given the paucity of time today i i i i i feel i'll dwell into just the part 2 of it which is very very key uh, to be exact i have tried to kind of uh, for the discussion sake uh, you know try to break it down into uh, actions on upstream middle stream and downstream right and to be very very uh, uh, exact there are about seven inclusions as a part of the upstream measures that could be taken to tackle plastic pollution there are about six inclusions on middle stream and about two inclusions on financing and capacity building that's the downstream now while we understand that all of these inclusions are very very important and they are equally you know uh, something that we need to address on i would touch on very very important aspects which i feel should be uh, you know mentioned today uh the upstream talks of the need to uh, take appropriate measures to reduce the demand of primary production of plastics that's the virgin plastic that we're talking of and also increasing or promoting the demand of secondary plastics so this is very critical considering uh, the the state that we are in uh, you know uh, giving that uh, impetus to secondary plastics is very key and also uh, you know the, the possible curbs on virgin plastic production and how that could be uh, done is something that is being explored now when i talk about these measures uh, there are multiple options that have been suggested in the treaty that could be negotiated by each of the government uh, and uh, of course our post the negotiation we will be looking at you know uh, one or two measures which would be definitely going on ground to take part uh, 
The next uh, point that I wanted to talk of was to take steps to regulate harmful chemicals used in plastics, which is again very, very key, considering the, the push that we are giving uh, to recycling and recycled products. So it's, uh, it's very important to understand what are those chemicals which should go in, which are permitted, which are hazardous, and which are not. So this treaty tries to put on a list of chemicals, uh, like I told you, the annexure, uh, where we will talk of uh, those chemicals which could be utilized and which could not. And, uh, uh, you know, there would be possible phase-out dates or, uh, you know, uh, immediate dates which the industry should look at to kind of curb these kind of uh, chemicals going into plastics. Uh, the third important key point which I thought I should bring up was uh, problematic or avoidable, uh, you know, plastics. This also includes the single-use plastics. Uh, we understand that India has taken uh, action on this already. Uh, we know that uh, you know close to 19 categories of single-use plastics have already been banned in India uh, since 2022. Similarly, you know this is uh, this is to promote in other countries as well that you know SUP is some, something that we need to look at to phase out. Uh, the next point, uh, which 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 is also very key, is uh, you know intentionally added microplastics. Now this is very key because. Uh, um, we find a lot of these cosmetic products coming these days which have microplastics which are intentionally added. Uh, face scrubs, face masks which have microplastics that have been added for a certain purpose. Uh, so this is something that is being addressed here again uh, on, on how uh, products and industry should be looking at you know facing out this. Uh, it also talks of, the, uh, uh, the upstream measure also talks of uh, establishing a robust EPR framework. Now, uh, this is uh, largely to kind of uh, incentivize reuse and recycling in the country. Again, here in India, we have uh, you know taken action on this. We've already established what I feel is a very robust framework as far as EPR is concerned uh, to address packaging plastics per se. Uh, so the other point that I thought was, was key was uh, on the design aspect. Now, uh, there, there is inclusion on design for environment where industry can take steps to kind of uh, uh, ensure that a product design can be made in such a way that it's more reusable, it's uh, refillable, uh, repairable, and refurbishable. These four aspects have been mentioned, uh, uh, you know, per se. And uh, the idea is largely uh, to reduce the dependence on virgin products and kind of ensure that reuse is kind of promoted as a part of the mainstream. Uh, we're looking at uh, other uh, steps in the middle stream and downstream, like I mentioned. Uh, the middle stream talks of waste management, uh, uh, middle stream and downstream talks of waste management uh, steps that are not permitted per se. For example, open burning of waste. So you will again find an annexure which will talk of those uh, methods of waste management which are not scientific enough and which should not be followed by member, uh, member nations. And that is something that will be, uh, you know, kind of uh, featuring as a part of the treaty. Uh, just transition, uh, you know, is, is very, very key, especially looking at the informal sector uh, and their contribution towards recycling of plastics. Uh, this is largely to ensure that there is a fair and equitable transition uh, and inclusive, of course, uh, of informal sector. Uh, and this is something that features very, very, uh, you know, soundly, in, uh, you know, in, in this uh, middle and downstream kind of measures that are there. It also talks of one very important measure, which I feel, uh, you know, industry plays a role uh, where, uh, you know, we're talking of transparency, of uh, tracking, monitoring and labeling, you know, which is very, very key uh, for, uh, you know, primary and secondary plastic producers. This is to kind of provide harmonized information on the chemical composition of plastics that would be coming out. So this is again one step towards uh, making uh, you know uh, awareness uh, uh, you know as far as uh, the chemical composition of plastics being utilized, and is a uh, is a step that would be uh, you know uh, that will be discussed as a part of this treaty. Well, with this, I think I will uh, pause here and uh, you know pass it back to you, Prajeshi. Uh, I'll be happy you. to since as they come over to you. Sure. Please. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kausikji, for your uh, good uh, overview of where we, what the treaty is and where we stand. So now we'll move to our like industry side, like how the industry is looking at this treaty in terms of uh, what it means for plastics industry. And we are talking, when we're talking about plastic industries in India, of course, Reliance is a big uh, 
uh, name. And of course, uh, Reliance uh, is not like a part of this treaty. We, are, uh, we want to get their view on the treaty. That's how we have invited them. And in terms of uh, their producer, consumer, as well as recycler. So from all these three aspects, uh, uh, what do you think uh, industry, how the industry has to gear up for this treaty? And what, what are the potential uh, implications for markets such as India? So Dr. Uh, uh, Patel, please. Sir. Yeah, so uh, good evening all. And uh, th th thanks, uh, Professor Dubey, for uh, giving opportunity to share some of the views as a polymer scientist, uh, because I have been working in this area from several years. And uh, uh, what uh, the treaty is, uh, the emphasis as uh, uh, Mr. Kaushik has already mentioned, it's about more on the recycling part and how reuse, recycling, uh, we can do it. And I'll just uh, like to share some of the things like uh, the big uh, four or five plastics which are used are the polypropylene, polyethylene, uh, you may be knowing PVC, polystyrene and PET. And these are the big five, you can say. And uh, overall, if you look at uh, uh, the thermoplastic uh, uh, polymer, which is mainly the PP, PE, and PVC, this is around uh, 12 to 13 million ton. And uh, if you put together polypropylene, polyethylene, this combinedly around uh, 50 to 60 percent of the total production is there. And uh, overall, globally, also the ratio is almost same. Uh, in a uh, globally, we produce around. Uh, 400 million ton and out of that uh, 50 to 60 percent is a uh, polypropylene polyethylene and the reason uh, this is widely used is uh, because your day starts with uh, you know polymer and the day ends with the polymer like you uh, you wake up in the morning and do that uh, this the toothpaste and toothbrush and everything then you drive a car and do wear a cloth or whatever you use it Everything has the applications, uh, you know, and which is consisting of the polymer. And uh, so going back to chaos is not a solution, but we have to find it out that how we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, take care of all these uh, things, which is environment pollution is there. Uh, so, uh, and that's the reason that it's used for a packaging infrastructure, as well as agriculture, household, healthcare, and consumer goods. So several areas, the applications are there. And uh, also the some of the area where it is used uh, for promoting the environment actually uh, helping the environment also the plastics are used and uh, even though this uh, thrust for the you know plastic recycling uh, in fact uh, has come in the last five to seven years or the eight years but if you look at the Indian industries are uh, the pace of the change is very fast now and a lot of uh, recyclers as well as producer, uh, consumer, but the recycler are getting, getting up very fast for the, you know, handling the various kind of raw material and the feedstocks. Uh, now, if you look at the different feedstocks, mainly the two kind of feedstocks which come. One is what you can is a, a flexible, uh, feed, flexible materials uh, where the, what uh, Mr. Kaushik mentioned is about the packaging films. And the other thing is a rigid uh, rigid uh, materials, uh, rigid plastics, what we can say. And that's almost around 60 to 70% of the rigid plastics. Uh, now, what we say is a rigid plastics is mainly it is used for the different packaging, whether it's your shampoo bottles or whether it is, a, a you know, soap solutions or even your paint, uh, all dabbas and all. So all these are very properly, you know, it is a recycle. It's a, like uh, we have certain things that even the Indian household don't throw such things. They keep it and they give it to the recycler. So such kind of things are very well recycled. And one of the reason is self-life. Self-life is around two years, five years. And uh, that is the reason it is very well recycled. And one of the best recycled material is a PET bottles. Now you will see that because uh, it's ultimately the uh, cost economics. So there is good cost economics and the whole ecosystem is developed for PET. And, uh, but not, uh, but this is well for the rigid plastics and, uh, but not for the polyethylene or the polypropylene PVC, which is a flexible. And that is one of the reason that uh, uh, its shelf life is hardly one or two days. We buy something from the uh, somewhere and uh, now there is already ban for a few of the things. But then these plastics end up into the municipality waste. And uh, it, this is very difficult to segregate, actually. Uh, so uh, there are the technologies are coming like uh, mechanical recycling. Few things I will like to specifically mention because we have wider audience. So mechanical recycling is... Uh, 
uh, where uh, because of EPR, uh, many of the old uh, plastics which are the rigid in the nature, it's already getting recycled. And it's uh, already, the, you may be knowing that few of the shampoo bottles or something you you use it 50 percent or 30 percent would be the recycled material is already used uh, so mechanical recycling but there are the challenges are there because you have to pick up then there is a shredding and the cutting is done and cleaning is done and it has a typical smells because uh, it requires whole cleaning process uh, so that is where the segregation would play the important role other thing is uh, now uh, the big industries uh, are gearing up with the using this uh, uh, plastics, which is PP and PE, and also, uh, you know, control in the control environment, it is a pyrolysis process is done. Many of you may be knowing, and we make a plastic, uh, the oil out of it. And in fact, globally, few of the companies have already started, you know, recycling this uh, oil back to the there is a refinery or there is a crackers and all. And because of this, you can see there is a complete circularity. You make uh, the first uh, raw material, you make a product. Again, you make uh, the raw material out of it, uh, like a monomer and make a plastic. So this is very good. And uh, few processes which are evolving, uh, which uh, we, which as a polymer scientist, I'm sure that, you know, a three to five years span, Already few uh, technologies are being developed are the solvent or the chemical based recycling where uh, right now, whatever the used plastic, it's not possible to make a virgin polymer. Uh, but so there are the several technologies which are coming that we can remove all the colorant and different kind of additives are added. And I can get the virgin polymer for the getting the same kind of quality as the starting material. And then there are the uh, also, the technologies which are uh, already uh, scientists are working was called the value generations or the value additions. So suppose right now my plastic is used for a certain applications. I upgrade that applications to the higher version. And uh, so, for example, if I do the functionalizations of the plastics, then even the cost of the raw material is uh, there. But if I move the product, I my value addition is a 2x kind of things. And uh, so several technologies are coming. Now, what are the challenges is uh, how the waste is handled uh, because that's ultimately the responsibility of every citizen municipality as well as the people because the problem is technologies are available but uh, if i get uh, the plastics wrap in the uh, few gram of plastic wrap in the half kg of the dust then it's very difficult to segregate it so if we have the segregation at the source uh, that is best the best thing to get it and uh, apply the several technologies and over the time, the volume of such technology, which is processing this kind of waste is also increasing. So it will help us for building the proper cost economics. Uh, one opportunity which is coming largely in the India is uh, this processing equipments because uh, uh, because of this recycling, a lot of small scale and the medium scale industries uh, like coming with the, the processing line where you can you know, share this input raw material, cleaning technologies, as well as extrusion technologies. So, uh, the thankfully, because the focus is there from last five to 10 years. So I am very hopeful and positive about uh, the solutions which industry and as a whole, uh, everybody from starting from producer to consumer to recycling, we can really work on that. And uh, the solution is already there and we have to master the in a disciplined manner and make a cost economic sense out, out of it. So that's what the few thoughts on the Sure. recycling sure. part of it yeah thank you thank you dr patil for the initial uh, thoughts so now we'll move to our third panelist uh, uh dipti she is joining us from uh, uh, i think australia right now also is based out in new zealand so dipti as uh, uh, we have talked earlier like uh, at the course of this uh, webinar preparation so i'd like uh, if you can just throw some light on uh, what this treaty mean in terms of uh, gender justice and climate resilience and of course, since you come from the island nations and in that area, uh, if you can just uh, talk something about uh, what your perspective from how it will help or uh, how it will make the plastic pollution possibly go uh, away in a new course of time, especially for all those coastal areas and all that. So the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Please go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And um, yes, so I'm going to what I'm going to do is I will talk about the benefits of the treaty and the gender perspective on that. But I think I will cover like a bit of a background on plastic pollution in the Pacific specifically and talk about um, gender impacts and how the treaty can help overall. 
So we've had a lot of discussion about the harms, the dangers of plastic pollution. And I wanted to emphasize in the, from a Pacific Island point of view specifically, that the Pacific as a region has kind of essentially become the world's dumping ground for plastic and other waste. Um, so there has been a lot of generation from domestic, things like domestic waste, um, and that has really been spurred on by rapid urbanization and consumption of um, like import of mass produced goods that have all been wrapped in um, plastic. There's a substantial amount of plastic because these goods are cheap, affordable, and because of um, this growing uh, need for uh, less plastic and more sustainable options in the West, the Pacific kind of becomes a great consumer area for these mass produced, cheaply packaged plastic goods. Um, that's one source of plastic, but also um, things like tourism with the influx of lots of tourists into the Pacific area. There's a lot of um, littering and cruise ships especially tend to dump waste out into international waters and that kind of gets flushed back to um, Pacific islands. Um, and there's also inadequate waste management in a lot of Pacific islands. Um, I was just in Tuvalu last year. And if you don't, if the audience doesn't know, it's a very small island in the Pacific. It's really been affected by the effects of climate change, especially sea level rise. There's tiny bits of land there. And there's, they're having a real um, problem with adequate waste management with the space that they have. Um, that's, a potent, that's something that's there. Um, so heaps of different sources of um, plastic pollution there. But the impacts are really, really substantial because of how tiny the islands are, essentially. So things like if we look at um, environmental harm, that's really evident with a harm to coral reefs. Entire ecosystems are damaged with lots of plastic litter in the ocean. Um, biodiversity thre threats. So marine life could get ingest microplastics or smaller bits of plastic. Um, uh, they could get entangled in plastic. Uh, there's a lot of habitat disruption there, but also there's like contamination of seafood with microplastics and seafoods are is a primary source of food for, for a lot of Pacific islands. And there's a risk to human life and animal health too with the ingestion of these toxic chemicals and plastic debris. And so there's all these different negative effects of uh, plastic pollution. But what I really want to emphasize today is that plastic pollution affects men, women, and other marginalized groups very differently because of um, distinct roles, responsibilities, and exposures, specifically in areas like waste picking and fishing. Um, so women in general are more exposed to the health risks of plastic pollution because often they're in charge of and responsible for things like collecting water, preparing food, caring for family, children, elderly. Um, so there's a lot of contact with potentially contaminated water there or um, other ha hazards. But women also face more economic um, challenges because they're most often employed in informal or low paid sectors, things like waste picking and um, fishing, where plastic pollution could affect their um, income, their workload. Um, and so on. But uh, women also, in general, tend to have less access to higher education, information and decision making power, which really li limits their ability to participate and benefit from waste management initiatives. Um, so again, so there's like, that, there's a clear, we've established that there's a clear problem here. Um, and, but that's not to say that there haven't been lots of proactive measures taken by lots of Pacific Island countries about plastic pollution. Um, I believe that Samoa was the first country to implement like a ban on single use plastics. I think it was in 2019. And New Zealand, where I, um, where I am right now, has also has a ban on single use plastics. Um, and, but these there are some challenges with these policies because things like lack of resources, challenges with enforcing these policies, um, as well as resistance from some stakeholders, and so, uh, it's really difficult to implement these. So there are some challenges there. Um, and to ensure that these policies and these measures have a good and equal impact, it needs to. It's really crucial to emphasize that a woman's leadership and participation are instrumental. Um, so I I am I really kind of um, highlighted in these efforts. Uh, uh, so in terms of um, the 
UN Plastic Treaty specifically and how that can kind of contribute to gender and climate justice as a whole. We know that the plastic pollution is a really complex and urgent problem. So I think it's really important to see that the, the plastic treaty is not just an environmental agreement, but it's also an opportunity for gender and climate change justice. Like, for example, um, the treaty can really help to advance gender justice by ensuring that women, girls, and other marginalized groups are equally involved and empowered in the decision making and the implementation of the treaty. So as we've really as we've discussed, uh, women, girls, other marginalized groups are disproportionately affected by plastic pollution because of different roles, responsibilities, and exposures within the plastic value chain. But they're also incredibly the key agents of change and leaders in the fight against plastic pollution too. So they have lots of um, women have a valuable knowledge, including indigenous knowledge, really important to highlight that the use of um, indigenous materials like flax and different uh, weaving techniques and using things from nature is also important to consider when looking at some an approach that is diverse and acknowledges the knowledge and the kind of um, expertise of everyone in, in these communities, including indigenous knowledge. So, they're incredibly valuable in sustainable practices and waste management with traditional knowledge. So it's really important to consider these perspectives. So it's really essential that the treaty uh, kind of recognizes and addresses these dimensions and ensures their meaningful participation and representation of women, girls, other marginalized groups are kind of spearheaded in all stages of the treaty. Um, yeah, so this is quite like this is a great opportunity to ensure that equality is spearheaded as well as the uh, goal of reducing plastic pollution and uh, advancing climate change justice. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dipti, for the initial thoughts. So we have several questions. In fact, some of them has already been answered uh, uh, by well, the panelist uh, while uh, it's like a uh, by typing it in, but uh, we have quite a few questions. So we'll start jumping to the questions uh, right away. Uh, before we do that, uh, I think uh, we would just like to run a poll for our audience. Uh, so Akansha, if you can just run the poll in terms of uh, what is the uh, level of knowledge that our uh, audience already has. So please uh, answer this, the question is there. So in terms of uh, like, a, what is what do you think about this plan? There are uh, four options. So if you can just put that uh, in there, we have 15, how many seconds left? Yep, please do that. That kind of also tells us that whether you are just logged in or you're also listening. <laughs> Sounds just stupid. <laughs> so, okay, so very good. We have 51 responses so far. Fifty-two. So I think it's okay. So I think it's stopped. So do you uh, share the results? So out of fifty-two people, says yes, it will create a major impact. Twenty-three people, forty-four percent thinks that it will create. For thirteen, are uh, like a, a a bit pessimist. No, it will not have practical implications. And forty-two percent is maybe I'm not sure. So if you look at forty-four plus forty-two, so eighty-six percent people are hopeful with the glass full or glass half full. So that's really good. So let's uh, move to uh, we can uh, close this poll now, and then we can move to the Q and A. So straight away, if I can jump in, uh, maybe I'll start with Dr. Partel. There was a question for you in terms of uh, what do you think the major technical long term, like 20 plus years challenges are there for recycling, either mechanical or chemical. Will there be degrading of multiple recycling material? And all that, if I can add a question to that, that there are so many, nowadays we use so much of mixed plastics. So how to even, um, sometimes is it really worth recycling? So uh, how to take care of those kind of plastics? So Dr. Patil. Yeah, so it's very relevant questions and uh... Uh, going forward, actually, you know, right now, the if you look at uh, the recycling, the mechanical recycling is uh, 
the major, if you look it out of 100, the majority of the people are doing the mechanical recycling. And uh, uh, But as I said, that uh, there are going forward, uh, uh, and in fact, few are using it because the plastic has a good calorific value. So few are using for uh, direct incineration. Incineration is not useful, but if, even if you, you want to use as a heat source, it is also is used. Uh, going forward, uh, uh, the if the the technology development is already being done. So as I mentioned, some of the technologies where it is possible to produce a virgin kind of polymer out of it. Uh, so there are already the plants being built up on that, where you can have the similar capacity of the uh, plants, which is a huge in the volume. Uh, they are already the investors are there and the companies are putting up a plant. Uh, there are also the uh, the the plastic is converted into oil and uh, in and sending back to the refinery for producing this. And uh, the, the right now we can say that uh, these are the few volumes, few examples are there, and uh, there are also a lot of uh, other like. Uh, the functionalizations of the plastics and the depolymerization, like the plastic, like PET is the best example where you can make uh, clothes again back from the PET bottles. And uh, there are already examples for such kind of things. So uh, if you ask me next uh, uh, five to 10 years, uh, there will not be single technology which will be dominating, but you will have the mixture of the technologies uh, like the mechanical uh, uh, chemical recycling, pyrolysis, as well as uh, you know, functionalizations of the material. So the combination of technology will exist. And uh, going forward, there will be the more, you know, the discipline and the, uh, in fact, if you look at, there is a already awareness has increased in last uh, four, five years, seven years. Uh, if you look at in a household also, in a societies and uh, wherever the people see, there is a separate segregations uh, for the waste, uh, wet and the dry. Uh, waste actually. So this is happening at the municipality levels and some of the cities are really doing good. Uh, so there is no single technology in summary, there will be the multiple technologies will be there and the recycling will uh, slowly will increase. So, uh, okay, so it will you. mature thank over the time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Patil. Uh, uh, like uh, in terms of this treaty, uh, see, at the end of the day, it is uh, we talk about plastic pollution most mostly from the ocean context, and but the the generation is on the land. It is our ULBs where most of the plastics are being waste is being produced, and then it goes to the river and finally to the ocean. So, to make this treaty really uh, applicable or to make this treaty really work, what the ULBs have to do? Like, what are the key takeaways for the ULBs? And if you can add about manufacturers and producers as well. And uh, before that, if you can just, there was a question on, very simple question on how many countries have already on board uh, for that. Uh, so if you can just uh, take the exact number of countries. Here. Sure, sure. That's 175 countries on board. Uh, and the complete list is available, you know, it's publicly available so that we can look it up. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's that. To take your other question, uh, Rajeshji, uh, I think that's a very pertinent point that you bring up because uh, irrespective of who's taking the decision, the final, uh, you know, uh, stakeholder who would have to take action is the urban local body or the local governments. And uh, the treaty does kind of explore roles for them as well. You know, there has been inclusion on, uh, you know, uh, the need to assess, uh, evaluate and identify hotspots as far as cities are concerned, uh, you know, as, uh, you know, where uh, marine plastic pollution is kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, originating from. Uh, this needs to be done at the city level, it has to be done by the city stakeholders uh, to take effective action in terms of mitigating and taking remedial measures. For example, clean up, uh, uh, in a, in a beach cleanup that needs to be taken or a certain water body like a nala in your city, which needs to be cleaned up. Right. So this again has to be done by the local municipality and there is a specific role that uh, you know they would play uh, in this regard. Uh, again, in terms of raising awareness, uh, you know, they play a very, very critical role. Uh, they have uh, a, a direct linkage between the citizen and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, to kind of ensure the consumer awareness happens. Uh, although it's also equally respons the, the responsibility of the industry to take care of it, uh, the ULBs will play a role uh, to get this happen uh, happening and up on the ground. Um, in, in terms of recycling targets as well, Rajeshji, there has been some inclusions uh, which... Uh, the cities and the governments, uh, as in the member states as such, would have to adhere to. 
so which will again boil down to you know particular states where there are recycling facilities which are there uh, uh, you know and and that will kind of uh, uh, you know ensuring that recycling capacities are being set up uh, to ensure that that target is met uh, that will again mean that you know the regulations for setting up such recycling facilities should be you know made simple should be made approachable you know the uh, 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 you know and and making them more uh, 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 you know, easy for startups and, uh, you know, other organizations to come and set up shop so that recycling can take place effectively. So this is in short, uh, you know, what I see for uh, the urban local bodies. Position. And what about what do you think should be the role of, uh, say, manufacturers or producers if you uh, to make that treaty really work? So, so I think that that is, again, another very major uh, stakeholder, like like I told you, this, uh, uh, you know, the uh, inclusions on intentionally added microplastics. No. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, these are uh, areas which will directly impact the industry, where they would have to take steps to kind of curb this kind of inclusions. Now, this is again being uh, deliberated. It's not, nothing in stone already uh, on, on what needs to be done. Of course, uh, the, in, uh, uh, the, the intervention will come from the industry. Again, another place where I feel where uh, effective action will take is uh, in uh, design for environment, where you're designing products which will be more reusable, more refillable, uh, and re refurbishable, largely to promote reuse. Now, Brajeshi, you also know that there are reuse targets for uh, under EPR where you know we are looking at in India. So again, that will play a direct linkage towards how this can be uh, kind of looked at in uh, you know in duration, both of them. Uh, mm -hmm. so in here is where I feel uh, this one again. Uh, the uh, uh, you know consumer awareness is a role that the industry will have to play. Uh, you know, as far as the treaties. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so, uh, uh, Dipti, I was wondering, uh, you see, one of the major to make this treaty really work, uh, we need a lot of capacity building. And since you do travel around those small island nations, so and including, say, even a big country like India, we do have issues of capacity building people who really understand on the ground. So, how you see that? Like, what kind of what is scale of capacity building would be required? Uh, to make it really work on the ground ultimately the things has to be done on the ground here so no please, you're absolutely right i think capacity building is kind of universally one of the biggest challenges we face within implementing anything like this and you're so right it is so important to make sure that everyone on the ground is um has a firm understanding and a comprehensive understanding of what exactly needs to be done or what what how it needs to be implemented and um, in my experience, honestly, the best, it's been the most receptive when you're literally there on the ground talking to people face to face and engaging in dialogues such as this one, where people can throw questions uh, back um, and I uh, can have a full on engaging discussion to really get to the nitty gritty of it. But again, that comes with its own challenges. That's very time consuming. How are we going to implement um, such a large scale treaty to that? detail in a shorter amount of time so that's again a big challenge I, I suppose um so I guess that we should really just try to kind of figure out how to work with the strengths that we already have and kind of continue capacity building in the hopes that it can kind of have a follow-on effect on the ground and get yeah. more people involved yeah so if I can add to that, there's a question from Mr. Chaudhary, Kuldeep Chaudhary. He's saying that, uh, in, of course, capacity building is one part, which we just talked. But uh, what are the steps being taken to address the social stigma and the discrimination often faced by informal West speakers, as you were talking earlier? Uh, like, how can the treaty contribute in terms of uh, changes in the society's perception about uh, uh, these informal recyclers or uh, kind of giving more or dignity to the role that they play. So do you uh, do you envision that kind of happening? Uh, that, uh... Yes, I think by including all perspectives in all stages of the treaty, we can kind of uh, uh, mitigate these challenges these waste pickers um, uh, and other informally employed um, people have in these sectors because they need access to proper PPE, they need proper wages, they need the employment to be solid and they want they need um, their challenges and their perspectives heard so that these things can be addressed and it can become more safe 
it can be more useful and it can actually be more productive overall and kind of end up changing the social stigma there. That is really crucial to make sure that we include these marginalized voices. Yes. Okay. So yeah, good. Uh, uh, Dr. Patil, uh, do you think uh, is, the, is the CSR programs working uh, of uh, this plastic industry in terms of helping uh, the ULBs uh, in terms of several organizations working there? Do we have a good CSR program on that sector? Uh, yeah, particularly uh, there are the few things on a waste collection site and uh, 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 this kind of, uh, uh, there are already a few of the agencies are there who are helping this uh, kind of the collection and uh, this uh, sort of uh, things that helps uh, for the like the pickers right pickers and uh, uh, and then they get the good value out of it so there are the certain programs are already there uh, the idea is that uh, in fact again i will narrate that the pet is the best example where they find out that you can uh, you know easily pick up from uh, that thing and uh, that's the reason that you will not find many pet bottles so there are a lot of ngos are working and the csr activities particular in that directions and uh, such kind of initiative for the flexible uh, uh, packaging if it happens then uh, it would be the again uh, good to look such kind of things you know okay. with a few of the ngos or the collectors and are there any uh like a finance available for startups in greenfield plastic recycling projects have you like are you aware of as an industry uh, as an industry project? right now uh, the many of the industries are trying to do their own actually but uh, there are the few uh, like there are few examples are there uh, banyan nations and these are the small companies uh, they are the independently are working on it and uh, they are building up the capacity. So yeah, ultimately at the end of the day, it's a cost economics which plays a role. And uh, and also there are a little bit premium is also coming for certain if uh, if certain uh, packaging material has a recycle components, then industries the user the, the user of the plastics are there. They are ready to you know give more uh, uh, the price for such kind of things and that is the reason that uh, there is more chances that such initiative will uh, uh, will sustain actually so there are few examples out there who are awesome. building up in such areas yeah Kausik, coming back to you say uh, we are have, the next meeting is in ottawa isn't it in uh, in april so what is what are the goal for the ottawa meeting like what we are going to what is the uh, what we want to achieve uh, in the ottawa meeting so largely, uh, we are looking at the different sections right now. Like I told you, there are six parts to it. Uh, you know, there have been uh, different working groups that have been uh, kind of organized for addressing each of these parts. Uh, there have also been a lot of uh, stakeholder interactions that have been happening. So inputs have been coming from that front as well. So all this will be largely taken into account. Uh, there has also been a revised zero draft that has been uploaded very recently. Uh, this is on top of the existing zero draft. So that is again something that will be deliberated, uh, uh, you know, in this meeting. And uh, we will look to, you know, arriving, you know, and a closure of each of these uh, sections individually, um, uh, largely to understand from each of these stakeholders and arriving at a mutually agreeable clause. Uh, that is the larger idea. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Tushar Bandopadhyay, he had a comment that, see, our consumption is uh, less than 50% of the world average. Why should we even agree for uh, this kind of proposal? So any, yes, what's your sir. thoughts? Yeah. So so I agree. Uh, they, the, our, our consumption is uh, pretty low uh, compared to the global uh, average as well. Uh, but considering that even then, the government has been very serious about tackling plastic pollution, it's very evident uh, you know, when we look at the number of amendments that we're having to plastic waste management rules, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, uh, the uh, even in 2023, we have had two uh, recent amendments that have come through. So uh, uh, also considering from 2022, we've had uh, the SUP ban that was, you know, uh, implemented and the EPR, which came into place. Uh, I see more of this as, uh, uh, you know, a concerted effort towards addressing this issue. Uh, uh, you know, this will all count for the global treaty uh, going ahead. 
uh, as, as one of the steps or check boxes, which we call, uh, because this is again being considered under the treaty as one of the steps like it. Okay, so thanks. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, the in, uh, in what is happening in Australia and New Zealand on this sector, like I, I, I was in Australia uh, in 2018 when they first, uh, the coals, they stopped giving the plastic bag and there was a lock of you <laughs> and cry and then within a month or so the bag was back. And what I heard is uh, after this COVID uh, pandemic, uh, the plastic usage has gone up everywhere, including in uh, island country like our Aust in Australia and New Zealand. So what is happening there? Uh, how they are looking at this treaty uh, in terms of government agencies, what they are, how they are preparing? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a great question, actually. Um, so in terms of New Zealand and Australia, we don't have plastic bags in our supermarkets anymore. So we used to have single use plastic bags that you could buy for, I think it was 50 mm -hmm. cents um, mm -hmm. if you forgot your reusable bag. But now the uh, the single use bag is uh, made out of paper and that's the only option that you have. Um, and there is a wide in New Zealand, there's a full wide ban on single-use plastics that has been for a long time and actually in New Zealand uh, starting this week I think the first of February the government has standardized recycling everywhere so before that um, each council each city had was in charge of um, deciding what goes into recycling bins what doesn't but since this week um, they're fully standardized that say they, they released new guidelines saying that everywhere in the country you need to follow these rules um, uh, in Australia uh, in the county that I'm in, uh, they've actually given out little compost bins to every single household. So there's uh, three different bins we have to use now, which is a green waste bin with the little compost, the recycling bin and the landfill. And um, that's very strict rules on that. They go through and check your bins when they collect to make sure that you're doing it right. If you're not, they write you a note on your bin to make sure you're doing it right there. Um, and yeah, plastic use has really gone up, especially in the Pacific due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, there has, especially with things like masks and also being more sanitary, it's it's really been an increase. I think trying to kind of manage that with more recycling initiatives, trying to get people to um, compost more, to be more mindful of taking recycling recyclable bags and you, doing small steps individually has been kind of the front of all these media campaigns uh, about tackling the plastic problem. So that's what's been happening here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Dr. Patel, uh, there is a question on that mixed plastics are used for packaging and it's almost uh, like almost 60% of plastic in India. That's what the, I'm not sure about the 60% number though. But is there a mechanism for returning it back to the producer uh, for the mixed plastic uh, as part, maybe as part of the EPR or, and the second question on that is also that what is the future availability of bailed patent PP or HDP bottles in coming years? Will Will that change? As an industry, what, yeah. what you're looking at? Yeah. So the the second question, uh, the actually, uh, basically there is a now mechanical recycling. Uh, there is good amount of mechanical recycling is happening in a rigid space. Basically, uh, the the containers which are used for the uh, uh, say uh, for the different FMCGs and uh, because of that uh, already there is a market there is uh, availability of such kind of recycled material is less and that is the reason that uh, if you go in a market and find it out that I need uh, the waste rigid plastics there is already the scarcity of it mm -hmm. so uh, the, the, the one way it is good that uh, you are not able to find such kind of waste there is already uh, the plastics uh, hard uh, rigid plastics are produced and it is getting recycled so uh, so that is a good indication actually and uh, related to the recycling to the producer basically uh, the how this plastic industry works is uh, as a producer makes the pallet and then it goes to the converters so there are the for example in india uh, in a polypropylene polyethylene there are 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 are the converters who convert these plastics into the various, various different articles. And uh, you cannot convert again back to the pallet in the same. So there is no way you can, again, uh, recycle back to the one who is produced. But what we can do is uh, 
uh, again convert into the uh, pallet and uh, reuse it. But uh, there is a limitation to such kind of recycling is that uh, if suppose my the end article has a, a brown color, I cannot make the white color out of it or blue color out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a limitation uh, for the recycling, but you cannot give back to the producer. It has to be converted into some other articles uh, only. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patil. Uh, uh, so, passing the takeaway, so is it, are we on track for uh, December 2024 in terms of uh, this treaty coming on board or where, how you see, uh, uh, since you are closely involved in, you are there in there, so just wanted to get your uh, sense uh, on that, yeah. So, so uh, yes, uh, I think the Secretariat is working around the clock. It was one of the questions that I answered. And, uh, you know, we are looking at a, a possible closure by year end, although it's going to be very challenging. Uh, we are getting a lot of inputs. Secretariat is working to, you know, process all of that, to put things in space for the next meeting also. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so that these can be deliberated you know, it's 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 not an easy process to kind of uh, get a common ground amongst so many countries. So, you know, that is something that uh, is being explored and this phenomenal work that's been going behind putting the documentation together. Uh, we, like I told you, there's a revised zero draft as well, which goes into further details of, uh, uh, you know, uh, each of the points that I mentioned and also, uh, you know, includes inputs from all the member countries uh, until date, which has been submitted. So I think I'm positive, uh, you know, we, we will be uh, looking at a possible closure and we know time. Uh, so thank you. So I think uh, we have taken care of all the questions, which is really great. Uh, we were able to answer all the questions. Uh, and so if you, if anybody has any final thoughts, otherwise we'll uh, close. Uh, anything you want to add, Dipti, on uh, what we... Yeah. Um, so I read through the, so the zero draft actually has a provision that says that um, there's like a gender, uh, that recognizes the gender dimensions of plastic pollution and it advocates the need for a gender responsive and human rights based approach in it. But um, I, the, the, I feel like there could be more like a stronger and more specific language used and have more specific commitments in terms of gender in the treaty, as well as more uh, participation and representation of women, but also specific marginalized groups to kind of get that intersectional framework into it, into the negotiation. So definitely it's there, but I think it can be improved in that sense. Okay, so I think, uh, thank you. Thank you. And then I'll hand it back to Akansha. Thanks. Thanks, Professor Dubey. Thank you so much to our panel today. And I think hopefully we have been able to address a lot of uh, queries. We're able to capture the opinions and voices as diverse as possible and contrary to each other. Uh, and hopefully uh, we're able to tackle all the questions that, that the attendees have been posing regarding this treaty. If there are any questions which are still pending, some more queries for... Uh, uh, Chandrasekhar sir, then I think uh, definitely they can connect on uh, LinkedIn. He's available there. I think all our panelists are available and um, we'll be sharing their email IDs if necessary. Uh, we like to thank uh, the panel panelists for taking time out and joining in for this uh, session. And um, Professor Dube and uh, Chandrasekhar sir can also let us know if there is a second part that we can do for this uh, particular topic then definitely and uh, you I mean the attendees can also share their views on that and as I mentioned this webinar is being recorded and will be available on Be Waste Wise uh, website and YouTube channel and if you like to stay updated about future events then you can connect and subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media. Thank you all for taking time out and have a very good evening and mornings and nights whatever to all of you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.